So we did the reciprocal of a linear function yesterday. Now we're going to look at the reciprocal of a quadratic function. Well, if it's a quadratic function like x squared, and I'm pointing to it right now, the reciprocal of that would look something like this. And maybe you've not seen one of these things before. This one spits apart as well, but both sides of the function are on top. Why is that? Because I'll show you why. Right? Let me draw in the x squared itself, a regular x squared function. I'll put it in in red. Right? Uh, 2 goes to 4, so it's going to be up here. All right, sorry about that last part there. So if I'm taking the reciprocal of this red line, the red line I just drew in a while, was put in a while ago, think about this. The top of this function is positive. It's a positive 1. The bottom is always positive. Why am I saying that? Because let's think about it. Something squared, doesn't matter whether it starts off being negative or positive, it's also, going to, it's, it's also going to be positive. So that's why this function is also, that's the reciprocal function, is also positive because the whole thing is positive. The only place that this function does not exist is at zero. So there's a restriction on this which says that x cannot be equal to zero. But otherwise, it, this function is not like the one we did before, in fact, on the previous page that we were on before, where there was one on top and one on the bottom down here. They were on different sides of the x-axis. Now this one is on the same side of the, oh, sorry. Now this one is on the same side of the x-axis. Both sides of it are on the same side of the x-axis. There's one side here, there's another side here, but it splits apart in the middle because it does have a VA. This does have a VA, and the VA is the x equals zero line. Right? The y-axis is the VA. Right? So if you wanted to put like as a dotted line, I'll put a dotted line to show you where that VA is. It is right, and I'll put it in a different color. I'll put it in blue. It is right about here. There is my VA right there. All right, that's my vertical asymptote for this line that we have on both sides. All right. Well, how about this one? This one says 1 over x minus 3 squared. So it looks like the vertical asymptote has shifted to the left by 3. In fact, if you think about it, this graph up here is 1 over x squared. And all, this, all I've done is I've taken this graph and I've shifted it to the right by 3. All right, that's why I have x minus 3 here. That shifts that whole vertical asymptote to the right. So the VA on this one is x is equal to three, right? And I'll put that VA in to show you what I mean. Here comes the VA now, right? About, okay, that's looked like a little bit off. Huh? That's not too bad. Let me try to fix that. Move that over just a tad. Okay, so there's your VA. Is there an HA? Of course there's an HA. You can look at the graph and tell that the HA is the y equals zero line again. And that kind of makes sense because of what we said yesterday. The top of this is a degree zero. The bottom is a degree two. The top is still less than the bottom. Is still less than the bottom. So that means that what Harish said earlier on still holds. It still has a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis, at the y equals zero line. All right, so there you go. Again, the top is always positive because the top is a constant. It's just a number. The bottom is also positive, and that's why you see that the, the graph is entirely above the x-axis. There's no part that's below the x-axis because this fraction has a positive top and a positive bottom. No matter what value of x you put in here, apart from 3, you're going to get an answer which is positive. Okay? All right. Now let's get to some more that are a little bit more challenging. I'm going to first of all, I'm going to show you how you can, how this can, you can make sense of this. This is the function I'm about to draw for you, right? The 10 over x squared minus 4x minus 5. But I'm going to relate that to <clears throat> the graph of the actual quadratic function that you have at the bottom here. Notice that this quadratic function has two zeros in it at minus 1 and 5. You could have figured that out because you could have factored that on your own. No problem there. So minus 1 and 5 are the two zeros of this function. And it has a 
this 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 whole thing became the denominator of this rational function. So now ask yourself, right? If this is the function that represents the denominator, and it looks like this quadratic here, but now I make that the denominator and there's a constant on top, should I expect this function that I created to have asymptotes, right? Are there values of x that would make this function undefined? Can you think of any? Can anybody think of any values of x that would make, what can x not be equal to in this case? Can anybody think of any values of x that would make the, the rational function a problem? No? Well, how about if I factored it? What about if I said 10 over x plus 1, x minus 5? How about if I did that? Okay, so Noah says 5. Is that the only one? And minus 1. And that's why this function, when I draw it, has zeros at those two points. But when I put that as a denominator, it now causes me to have vertical asymptotes. So one asymptote is at 1, and the other one is going to be at minus 5. Because those are the restrictions on this thing. So I'm going to put those asymptotes in, and I'm going to try to draw this function. So here come my asymptotes. 1 is going to be at wherever this original function, wherever this quadratic function had a 0, I would expect that the rational function should have an asymptote. So here comes my asymptote. Let's put it in, in I don't know, in blue or maybe red. All right. So here comes my vertical asymptote. I'm going to put one right here. I'm going to put another one right here. So I'm thinking when I draw my function, it should be following these vertical asymptotes. How about the horizontal asymptote? Can anybody tell me what they think the horizontal asymptote of this function probably is? We've talked about horizontal asymptotes enough for us to know what the horizontal asymptote of this function probably is. Can anybody give me the horizontal asymptote, please? Where's the horizontal? What's the equation of the horizontal asymptote? Anybody? Follow the rules. Y equals zero, the x-axis. So here we go. I'm going to put that in as well. So what does this function look like? Well, let me give you some more clues as to what to expect. Thank you very much, uh, Noah, by the way. If the 10 at the top is positive, which it is, this function should be positive wherever the bottom is positive. So to the left of this asymptote, right, where this quadratic function is positive, the rational function should also be positive. To the right of this asymptote, where the quadratic function is positive, then the rational function should also be positive. But in between both of these, where the quadratic function is negative, then the rational function should also be negative. So I don't know if you can sort of sense what's coming, but here comes the graph of the function. Whoa, did everybody see that? It actually does have a piece. Let me get rid of the asymptotes a little bit so that you can see. Or maybe I should have made these asymptotes a different color. I wonder if I can change it now. Let's see if I can change it. Change it to maybe blue. Yeah, that seems to work. And change this one to blue as well. Change that one to blue. Okay. So if you look now, then you can still see the asymptote here. And the function is moving towards the asymptote up here and over here. And then it's moving towards the horizontal asymptote right here. Then there's a piece in the middle that seems to be also moving towards the horizontal, sorry, the vertical asymptote on this side and the vertical asymptote on this side. And it almost looks like an upside down parabola. Almost looks like an upside down parabola. All right, so it looks like this function is now three parts to it. Not just two, but three parts to it. On the previous one that we had on this page, I'm going to delete this. Uh, this function had one piece over here and one piece over here. So did this one. One piece here, one piece there. But no, this function has three parts. It has one piece over here, one in the middle, that's upside down, and the other one that's over here, making it three distinct parts of the function. All right? So we're going to be talking about behaving here the vertical asymptote and the domain and range and all that stuff later on. But for right now, let's just answer the question of what is the HA, what's the VA? All right, and also what's the y-intercept?
forgot to mention that. So the HA of this function, I'll put that, all right, let's move this out of the way here. The HA, I think we agreed, was the y equals zero line. The VA, well, turns out there are two VAs. It's the line x equals minus one, and it's also the line x equals five. This graph has two VAs, right? This vertical line here and this vertical line here. Those are my two VAs. And it separates the three parts of this function, one on the left, one in the middle, one on the right. Okay, and how about that y-intercept that we talked about? Let's see if I can find what that y-intercept is. Well, y-intercept comes from setting, and again, here's my function that I'm trying to figure out. 10 over x squared minus 4x minus 5. Plug in 0 for x. I'm just left with 10 over minus 5. So it sounds like my y-intercept is minus 2. Okay, let me get rid of this stuff here. My y-intercept is minus 2. And that's why the graph looks the way it does. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to split up this graph into what I'm going to call intervals. And I'll explain later why I'm doing that. As I'm going to put one interval. Let's see if this works a little better now. I'm going to put one interval at minus infinity up to minus 2. Maybe you can see why I'm doing that. I'm going to go from minus 2 to the center between both of these. So I'm gonna go from minus one to five. The center between minus one and five is actually two. I'm gonna go from two up to the five, and I'm gonna go from five up to infinity. All right, so I'm gonna ask some questions of the class about each of these intervals. So one interval, I'm gonna go back and show you on the graph. Now one interval goes from minus infinity up to my, oh, hold on, that's not right, minus one, I'm sorry. Let me change that, I'm so afraid to erase anything now. Let's see, hopefully this is gonna work. That should be minus one here. Okay, so minus one, minus one. So I'm going from minus infinity up to minus one, I'm gonna go from minus one up to two. I'm gonna go from two to five. Then I'm gonna go from five to infinity. We're gonna ask, why did I go to, 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 to minus two? Well, I went to minus two and that was wrong. 151, I was okay. So I should, I should, um, I should have gone to minus one because minus two doesn't, there's nothing really happening at minus two, okay? There's, there, I, really should, I really should have gone to minus one. So it was, it's a fair question that you asked uh, Noah and Jeremiah. Okay, and I changed it. Okay, so when the question says, what is the sign of f of x? What's the sign of the function? Let me tell you what that means. A very simple question to answer. The sign of the function is, is the function above the x-axis or below the x-axis at that point? Is it positive or is it negative? That's what the sign of the function means. Right? So if the function, and I'm going to point to it, if this part of the function is above the x-axis, as it is, then that function is positive at that point. So for me, what I do when I want to write the positive, instead of writing out the word, I just put a plus. Oh, sorry. I just, okay. Hope this thing is not going to act up again. I put a plus with a VE to say it's positive. Now, let's see, I'm gonna fill in that first row with, with, with you and see if maybe after a while you'll, you'll get this. What is the sign of the function between minus one and two? Well, between minus one and two, where I'm pointing now, goes from here to here. Well, this is all below the x-axis, so it's still, no, at this point, no, it's negative. From two to five, from two to five, I'm still below the x-axis, so I'm still negative. But then when I get to five and beyond five all the way out to infinity, I become positive again. That's my short form for positive. Does that first line make sense to everybody? I just want to be sure that that makes sense to everybody. Let me do a quick room check. You know, I like to do that. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Axel. Thanks, Noah. 
Okay, you know what? I got enough reaction from that. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we're good with that. So all we're asking is, is I'm, I'm, that section of the graph, am I above or am I below? That's all I'm asking. Now, the second part of this is different. It's like, was, and I'm going to tell you what this is like. This is like asking, is the function increasing? That's what this is. When it says the slope is positive or negative, it's the very same question like yesterday when I asked you, is the function increasing? Because an increasing function means the slope is positive. A decreasing function means the, when the function, means the, the function is going down means it's negative. That's all it means. Now, we're not talking about putting your hand up against the screen and watching how your hand rotates. That's coming up in the next part. All we're asking is, is it going up or is it going down? That's it. Okay, so let me get some help from you now. Between, so I'm going to ask that question between these different intervals, from minus infinity to minus 1, from minus 1 to 2, from 2 to 5, from 5 to all of that. We're going to ask those questions and, answer, and I'm ask you to answer for whether the slope is positive or negative or to ask the, another way of asking the question, is it increasing or decreasing? Can you use the same clockwise when you're able to determine when a function is positive? No, no. And let me answer this. This seems like the way to calculate maximum and minimum from Cohen. Is that right? Um, to some extent, yes. But let me answer Noah's question first. The clockwise rotation maneuver is what we're going to be doing on the last line. That's different from what we're doing now. All right? I'm asking for where the function is increasing or decreasing. All right? So is the line, as you go from left to right, going up? Or is the line as you go from left to right going down? These are tables similar, but not the same. I see. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So, Noah, work with me on this now. In the first section of the graph, going up to the minus one, would you describe the slope of the function, not the change in the function, not the change in the slope, but is the function going up or down as I go from left to right up to minus one? It's increasing. So the slope is positive, which means the same thing as it's increasing. It means the same thing. Okay, Jeremiah is x then, but that's calculus, right? Then f of x, f oh yes, yeah, that is calculus. I'm assuming you've been doing that in probably quad four or something. Okay, so this positive and it's going up. Now, let's keep going. Let's keep not just Jeremy, not just uh, Noah, no. Right, but for everybody else, oh, sorry. Okay, what did what just? Okay, there we go. For every, for everybody now, what's happening as I go now between minus one and two? So between minus one and two, what's happening to my? Is my slope still positive, or is my slope now? Is it now increasing or is it decreasing as I go from minus one to two? Can anybody help me out with that? Not just know everybody else. Between minus one and two, what's going on with the function? It is, no, Riley, no. It, look at what the others are saying. It is not decreasing, it's increasing because it's going up. Watch what happens as I move along the curve. It's going up as I move towards the two. So it's still a positive slope. Or another way to say, it's still an increasing function. They both mean the same thing, right? Now, once I get past the two, did something change? Let's find out. Is the slope going to now become negative and is the function now decreasing once I get past two? So between two and five, what's going on now, right? Is the function increasing or decreasing? It is negative as Emily said and Harish and everybody else said it's decreasing. So that's exactly right. So now it's gonna be negative, meaning the same thing as it's decreasing. Good stuff. So, We've done between minus one and two. We've done between two and five. Let's get across here now from five to infinity. What's going on on the other side? I'm taking calculus next year. I see a grade 11. Okay. What's going on on the other side? As I go from this asymptote all the way out to infinity, am I decreasing or increasing? Okay. I see two decreasings there. Everybody going to agree with Charissa and everybody? You're quite right. It's decreasing. So it's negative or decreasing. That's what the slope is, right? The slope. I'm not asking how the slope is changing. That's a different question. 
I am asking whether the slope is positive or negative. Is it going up? Is it going down? That's all I'm asking. Okay. Are we are we writing minus BE as well? You can do that, Jeremiah. That's fine. I, I generally use that as a as an abbreviation um, for positive or negative. And I also use the upward arrow and the downward arrow for increasing or decreasing. Okay. All right. Now, this thing of change in slope is what I was referring to yesterday when I was looking at how the rotation of your hand is as you put it up against the edge of the function. So what I want you to do now is start putting your hand or ruler or anything like anything you like up against the screen and see if I put a tangent here and another tangent here, Right, so there's a tangent, another tangent. As I move to the from left to right, as I put my hand up against the function, and I'm as I'm as I'm just tracing out a tangent, that part that goes from minus infinity to minus one, would you consider that to be an increasing slope or a decreasing slope? Is my hand turning in a counterclockwise direction or a clockwise direction? That's the question I'm asking. Okay, I have three people saying it's increasing. It's going counterclockwise, it's increasing, and I would absolutely agree with that. So the slope is increasing at this point. Okay, good stuff. Okay, let's see if you're gonna be good now for the second part. As I go from minus one to two, so in this middle part, only up to two now, we'll take from two onwards in a little while. From minus one to two, think of slopes now, put slopes in, right? Put your hand up against the edge of the function, put one here, put one here, and up to just up to two, and ask about that rotation of your hand. Is your hand rotating counterclockwise or is it clockwise? And therefore, you can now tell whether it's an increasing slope or a decreasing slope. Look at Noah, look at Keante. Both of them say it's clockwise and therefore it's decreasing. Absolutely correct. Good stuff so far. Hope nobody's going to trip up on the next one now. What happens when I go past, Karis is saying decreasing as well, well done. What happens if I go past two now? Between two and five, again, keep that hand there and see if it is either turning into clockwise, or sorry, turning, or is it, is it gonna turn into counterclockwise or is it gonna continue going clockwise? As you go from two now to five, what's happening to the slope when you go that way. So I can't fool you guys at all. It continues being clockwise. So it's still decreasing. It's still a decreasing slope, right? Still clockwise. So it's clockwise all the way from minus one up to five. That's a clockwise rotation. Okay, on the other side over here now. So now we're at five going on to infinity. When you get to the other side, what's happening over here? So again, put a slope in here. Put another slope here and then ask yourself, as I'm, as I'm rotating on the other side after five, right, from five to infinity, what kind of rotation am I looking at once I go past the five? Let me see what you're going to say this time. When I go past the five, what kind of rotation? As I go from left to right, how is my rotation going? Keonta says increasing. What do other people think? All right, counterclockwise, counterclockwise. If we're going to left of right it's counterclockwise left to right yes we're going left to right and so you're absolutely right it's going counterclockwise which is an increasing slope so what we're saying is that from minus infinity up to the minus one the first asymptote is such an increasing slope when we go in between both of these it's going to be decreasing all the way from minus one to five once you get past the five it starts to increase again Okay, well done class. Now, let's answer some other stuff down here. Behavior near the asymptote, the vertical asymptote. Now, there are two asymptotes, so we have to do this twice. We're going to, first of all, ask, as X approaches the first asymptote, remember, I'll tell you both of them, was at minus one. So I'm gonna say, as X approaches minus one, minus, Remember what that means, folks? Remember, it means that I have to go from the to the minus one from the left. So here's my first asymptote. As x approaches minus one from the left, 
where is my function going? All right, let me make sure you can see the picture here. As I approach that first asymptote from the left, where is my function heading? Who can answer that question? So I'm coming in, coming in from the left, coming in from the left. Here's my asymptote right here. What's going on with the function? Emily says it's going, look at that. It's going towards positive infinity. Wow, I'm impressed. Well, let's ask the question on the other side. As X approaches minus one from the right now, what's happening to my Y? So let's come back up and look at that again. So I'm approaching it from this side. I'm coming to, here's my, here's my asymptote right there. And I'm coming to it from the left, from, sorry, from the right side now. That's what the plus means. So what happens as I approach it from the, from the right side now? All right, I don't see any answers yet. All right, what happens as I approach it from the right? As I'm moving closer and closer and closer to the vertical line, what's happening to the function? Where is the function heading now? All right, watch what happens. I'm moving towards it, moving towards it, moving towards it. Look at what the function is doing, all right? You can see where the function is going. It's going to negative infinity, absolutely. Okay, but there are two asymptotes. Well done. Thanks, Rylan. Thanks, Emily. And thanks, Keontae. And thanks, Noah. But, and who else? Yeah, right. Okay. Well, let's look at the other one. Though. There are two asymptotes. Let's ask now as X approaches five from the left. I'll, I'll show you the graph in a second. Where is my Y going? And as X approaches five from the right, you have to answer both of these questions from the graph. Let's go have a look at the graph. As X approaches from the left, here's my asymptote, right? Here's my asymptote. As I move in, as I move in closer and closer and closer and closer, where does it look like the function is heading? So I'm moving towards the asymptote, moving towards it from the left. What do you mean minus one? Yeah coming from the positive side of the dark side, correct. Okay, let me, let me get to Jeremiah's question here. And one or the other way around. When you mean minus one, you are coming from the positive side to the negative side, correct? Okay, it depends. I have the, mi okay, let me go back to the one that we're you asked about here. Minus one minus means I'm approaching from the left. Minus one plus means I'm approaching from the right. Same thing here. This is positive five. I'm approaching it from the left first, then I'm going to approach it from the right. Does that make sense, Jeremiah? Good. Okay. So let's get back to the positive five now. So as I get to positive five from the left, I see an answer there from Keontae who is saying it's minus infinity. And I agree. I absolutely agree with that. Now, what happens if I'm approaching it from the right? So here's five plus. Here's my graph, and I'm moving towards it now from this side, moving closer and closer from this, from this side. positive infinity. Well done. Positive infinity is 100% right. Okay. The domain of this function, I think everybody knows this, but I'm going to write it down. The domain of this function is fairly easy. It's XER, but X cannot be equal to minus 1, and X cannot be equal to five. Those are the two restrictions on the X. The range is more tricky. <laughs> okay. That's going to take us a few minutes to get through. So brace yourselves, folks. Take a deep breath and watch what I'm about to do. Let me show you the graph again. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of some of these asymptotes because they're kind of getting in the way a little bit. All right. So let's delete that for now. And let's also delete this for now. It's good to have the asymptotes there, but right now they're kind of getting in the way. And let's take away this one as well. Oops, sorry. Let's delete that as well. Okay. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take away also this other graph here. Because this one is the focus. I need to disconnect this. Give me a second. Disconnect. Okay, I just want us to focus to do interval notation, right? Uh, for, for what part now? You mean what part are we talking about now? What part for the interval notation to answer which question, by the way? No, the range. Uh, yeah, I think it would be. You'll see in a second. You, and, and you're right. I think it would be a good idea to use that. But let's just see what, the, what, the, what this is. 
So it appears that this graph exists everywhere above the x-axis, right? It seems that way to me. I don't know about if it seems that way to you as well. So it looks like x greater than zero would be part of the answer, but there's a part of the graph that's also below the x-axis. Does everybody agree with that? That there's a part of the graph that's below the x-axis. So we have to figure out what that part is. And it looks like it's everything below a certain value. So it's everything above zero and also everything below whatever this y value is right here. But we don't know what that y value is, but there's a way to find it. So remember those asymptotes we had before? Maybe I should put them back. Let me put the asymptotes. Uh, okay, let me put let me to, let me put two of those asymptotes back for a second here because I think that might actually help us out for part of this. Let me put it in in blue. So one asymptote was at minus one, and the other one was at five. No, turns out that this point that is the high point right here is right in the center between these two asymptotes. Remember when lock in the minimum, then take the reciprocal of it? Just look at the minimum, then take the reciprocal of it. The minimum of what? You mean take the minimum of the original quadratic function? Is that what you're thinking? Um, not quite, not quite, right? But let's just keep going here. Uh, we'll, we'll see how this works in a minute. In a sense, you might be you kind of on, on the right track in a, in a in a what sense? Because this maximum point is in the center between both of these lines. And you think back to the stuff you did on quadratics in grade ten. You knew that to get that midpoint, what you did was you took the two zeros, added them together, and divided by two. I'm going to do the same thing here. So minus one plus five divided by two. Y'all hopefully remember that from grade 12. So this looks like it's four over two, which is equal to two. So it means that I have the X value and you can almost see it on the graph. I have the X value for where this function reaches to this little maximum in the middle. I just need the Y value now. Can anybody suggest how I can get that Y value? Right, because that's really what I need. I need the y value. Because y is the range. We're not talking x's for the range. We need the y. Yes, Jeremiah, go. Let's do that. So we're going to put that into this equation right here. So we're going to say that the y is equal to 10 over 2 squared minus 4 times 2 minus five. We're going to do exactly that. So that y is equal to 10 over four minus eight minus five. Did I do that right? I think I did. Which is equal to 10 over minus four minus five is minus nine. So I'm going to say that there is a Maximum point, it's a relative maximum, by the way. It's not an absolute maximum. There's a max point at 2 minus 10 over 9. That looks about right. If you look at the graph, you can see that this y value does look like it's somewhere down below here. So minus 10 over 9 kind of makes sense. And I show you something Noah says, uh, what is that? Tell, tell me what you, let me, let me finish this first, Noah, and then, then yes, you can show it to me after that. Karis, by the way, Karis, I just noticed that you had the answer as well, plug two into the equation. So hold that thought for me, please, Noah. Okay, so max point is there. So here's how I'm gonna state my range now, right? So we're gonna get to the range now. We actually haven't stated the range yet. So the range would be, that, and let's use the interval notation that Noah had suggested a few minutes ago. It would be, I'm going to start at minus infinity, right? Let me take you back up to the graph for a second here. 
<clears throat> excuse me, minus infinity up to uh, looks like, okay, hold on, we're, we're using, we're using um, range here. So minus infinity is down here. It goes all the way up to this Y value of minus 10 over nine. Union with, oh, by the way, let me change this. There's something wrong with this answer. Can anybody tell what's wrong with this answer? Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this answer? Minus infinity to minus 10 over nine. Is minus 10 over nine included in my answer? Should I, should I include that in the range? I should have a square bracket there. Thank you very much. So let me fix that. Let me, let me fix that. It should be a square bracket right about here. All right, so I'm going to put that back in as union with, on the other side of that, let me keep going up the y-axis. So I started at minus infinity, and all the way up to this point right here, we have to go from here up to positive infinity. That means I have to go from zero up to positive infinity now. So we go ahead and say union with zero to positive infinity. Now we know we need to put a, a round bracket on that. Should I put a round bracket or a square bracket on that zero? What, what's, the, what's the round is correct? Because we're not including zero because the function doesn't actually touch that x-axis. So it's never actually going to be zero. And Harish and, and Karis are both correct. So that's my range. My range goes from minus infinity up to minus 10 over nine. Let me just show you on the graph. Starting down here, anywhere down here is fine. And it goes all the way up to minus 10 over 9. And there's a gap, a little piece where there is nothing. The graph doesn't exist in this little gap right here. And it picks up again once you get to 0, just beyond 0, all the way up to positive infinity up here. Okay? All right. Noah wanted to share something with us. So I stopped sharing. My Noah, did you want to share your screen with us? Is that what you wanted to do, Noah? Sure can. So let's do this. Oh, you know what? For some reason, okay. Can I get it to graph it here? Okay, let me let me get some get rid of some stuff off the graph here. Give me a second here. Sometimes the graph is too crowded; it doesn't like to put anything else on it. So let me erase all of this stuff. Okay. Let's see if it's going to give me the give me the option to graph it now. Come on, no, it's not. Let's see. Let's see if I can make it graph it anyway. No, it's not. It's not giving the option to graph anymore. But I can do a I, I can do a little sketch of the graph anyway. Um, or you know what? I'll just I'll just put it in. So we know it goes here at minus one, and it goes at five, which is about here. And it comes down. Okay, that's a very bad graph, folks. And it goes down through the minus uh, two, the vertex. Okay. Two, negative nine, is that the vertex? Okay. All right, so let me do a little better job. Two, negative nine is somewhere way down here. Sorry about that, folks. Okay. All right, so it's a rough drawing. I know. Sorry about that. But tell me, tell me what, tell me what you wanted to tell us now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. That, that That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Okay, there's a little bit of a shortcut. Okay, thank you very much for that. That's a fair, that's a fair point. Okay, so at least we now know that we can actually come up with a, with, with a range by getting what that midpoint is. And you, you made the point that the midpoint is the same place where the vertex is on the original function. And then we can put the 10, yes, the minus 10 over the, over the value of the function at that point, which is going to be the 9. Okay. And there's your, there's your range right there. Let's try this on the second function. Let's see how much time we have, 219. 
Let's go to this function and let's see if we can do this fairly quickly. We have two more functions to go. And I hope I was trying to see if I could give you some time to work on your homework as well, but we'll see how that goes. Well, let's graph this. Let's graph if this thing will cooperate. Generate graph. Oh, it's giving me a brand new graph. Oh, that's not good. No, we don't want that. Let me undo that. All right, so what, I, what I'll do is I'll do my own rough sketch for this one because I just realized that this is actually just a, a, a grid from Desmos. So let's just, let's just put our own little graph together here, All right? Um, this function, right, this denominator here, what, what becomes a denominator here can be factored, as you know, into x minus 3, x plus 1. All right, so this has a, a zero at three and a zero at minus one. And it also has a y-intercept of minus three. So this is somewhere around here. And if I had to draw a little sketch of this, I'd say it probably looks something rough sketch. No, that's way too rough. That is way too rough. Let's say it's coming about here. It's a little bit better. So that's the original quadratic function. So again, if I made this into a denominator, that means that I should have vertical asymptotes where I have zero on this function. So let me attempt to put that in for you, All right? So not as I want, I want to do a straight line again, All right? With a different color, maybe I'll put it in blue. I should have a vertical asymptote right about here. And another vertical asymptote right about here. Okay. Now the top of this function is a minus three though. The other one that we had before had a, so come on, okay, try to leave early so I have a good weekend. You have to leave, okay, okay, Janaya. All right, try to make sure you watch the video later on, okay? All right. So. So we need to think now about how this is going to look this time compared to the last one. The last one had a positive numerator. This one has a negative numerator. Still has the same asymptotes right here. No. And by the way, where is the y-intercept of this one? Where would you say the y-intercept of this function is? Anybody? Quickly, we're, we're kind of running out of time a bit here. Can anybody give me where the y-intercept of this function is? All right, just plug in zero for x and tell me what that y-intercept is, please. Because that's going to help us to draw this very quickly. Where's the y-intercept of this function? Plug in zero for x and what's left over? Come on, I can't believe I don't have an answer already. All right, you've forgotten it. It's at, it's at one. Thank you very much. So there's a y-intercept at one somewhere around here. So I'm thinking that for this function, it's probably going to have that piece in the middle that we had on the first one that looks something more like this up here, then the other pieces are going to look something more like this on the other side down here. That's what I'm thinking, right? And, it, no, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why that makes sense. If the top of the function is negative, then wherever this other function that we're looking at now is positive, then the resulting function should be negative. So that's why this thing is down here on this side. In the middle here where this function is negative, since the top is negative, it means that the, re the resulting function should be positive, right? Because two negatives give you a positive. And where the, um, this graph here, the black line is positive, the other function should be negative because the top is neg a negative divided by a positive is a negative. So that's why this part is down here. So what I want to do is just quickly run through some of what we did the last time. I'm going to put some intervals in and see if we can just quickly fill in this table. So my first interval is going to go from minus infinity. I'm going to put that in black, minus infinity, up to minus one again. I'm going to go from minus one up to one this time. I'm going to go from one to three. I'm going to go from three to infinity. All right, let's see how quickly we can fill this in now. The sine of the f of x, the sine of the f of x, remember, 
is all that is asking is, is the function above or below the x-axis? Is the function positive or is the function negative? That's all. Not whether it's increasing or decreasing. None of that's what we're asking about. So let me see if you can quickly help me out. Between minus 1, sorry, minus infinity and minus 1, between here and here, is the function positive or negative? Kari says negative. Harish says negative. Noah says negative. They're all correct. Negative is correct. In between minus 1, right, and 1, what are we talking about now? Is it positive or is it negative? Between minus 1, no, it's positive. In between 1 and 3, what's going on there? Quickly, between 1 and 3, what would you say is going on with the function? So from here to here, positive or negative? 1 to 3. Rylan is on the ball. 1 to 3 is still positive. When you get past 3 and 3 to infinity, what's going on with the function there? Is it still positive or is it now negative? Keanta says it's negative and it is absolutely negative. Let's see if we can fill in the other stuff very quickly. The slope. No. Slope of the function just refers to is it increasing or decreasing. That's it. No hand, no rotation, none of that stuff. Is it going up or is it going down? That's it. Done. Where's the slope from minus infinity to minus 1? What's the slope there? It is decreasing, absolutely. And I'm just going to put slope as negative for that, which means the same thing as decreasing. How about between minus 1 and 1? Between minus 1 and 1. What's going on there, folks? Negative, absolutely, or decreasing. How about between 1 and 3? What's going on between 1 and 3? Let's see if we can do this up very quickly. What's that between 1 and 3? Thank you very much. It's positive or it's increasing. Same thing. And how about between 3 and infinity? What's going on there? Thank you, Jeremiah. It's positive or increasing. Change in slope. Now, here's a more complicated one. <clears throat> That's where the hand comes in. Let's see if you're going to do a good job with this one. Is the slope increasing? And this is not positive or negative, no. Is the slope increasing or decreasing between minus one, sorry, minus infinity and minus one? Okay, Jeremiah says decreasing. What do other people think? Between, I'm talking about a change in slope now. Here's where the rotation of the hand comes in. Increasing, decreasing. Excellent. Decreasing. How about between minus one and look at the graph. Let me take you up to the graph. How about between minus one and one? What's going on there now? Increasing, good stuff. How about between one and three? What's going on between one and three? Between one and three. Okay, it's still increasing, good. And how about between uh, three and infinity? It's decreasing. All right. So behaving near the vertical asymptotes, I'm going to kind of leave that because I really, in the time that we have left, I need to get to the last graph, which is a little bit interesting. It's going to be interesting for this one. We know where vertical asymptotes are for this. We know where horizontal asymptotes are for this. But let's talk about this graph. This is the first one that's different from the others that we had. Can anybody tell me how this one might be different? Right Before we try to predict what it looks like, it has no, what do you mean it has no zeros? You don't think uh, x squared plus two has zeros? You don't think so, Jeremiah? Are you are you serious about that? You really don't think it has any zeros? You sure about that? Jeremiah, for the final, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't square it. Okay, so I'm not fooling anybody. Okay, I do that sometimes because I want you to rethink what you said. But if you're sure that you're right, you should just say, yeah, yeah Mr. Khan, that's what I'm saying. And you're right, this one has no zeros. Hmm. That's interesting. So let's talk about VAs and HAs and all that stuff now. It doesn't have an X value with a single degree. Uh, it doesn't have an X value with a single degree. Hmm. Okay. All right. That, that may be true. But let's get to HA and VA and all this other stuff. Let's get, to, let's get to VA first. Right? What would the VA be on this graph? Can anybody think of what the VA is on it? We had the VAs before, so we can understand the VAs on this one. What would the VA be on this graph? Where is the vertical asymptote on this graph? Anybody? Nobody? No VA, right? Ooh, really? Really? Do you agree with Jeremiah on that? He says there is no VA. Does that sound right to you? Harry says yes. Oh, dear. Okay, so none is the answer. 
Okay, let's see if we can get something else then. How about the HA? What would the HA on this one? Jeremiah says that Y equals zero. Y'all gonna agree with Jeremiah? Harish says yes to. Anybody else on the HA? Degree, numerator, small. Oh, well, so apparently it is then. So Y equals zero, yeah. I guess that's the, <clears throat> that's the horizontal asymptote. Let's get one more thing here. Let's get the y-intercept. Do we at least have a y-intercept on this? Come on, folks. We've got to try to wrap this up before the class is done. Noah says two. Um, do you all agree with two on that? No, somebody could say, oh, we say, oh, wait, four. <laughs> okay, so four. How about x-intercept? X-intercept. What would the x-intercept on this one be? Uh, by the way, I agree with the four, by the way. None. Wow. So what does this thing look like then? It doesn't have any VA. It does have an HA. Okay, let's put the HA in. Let me put that in. Maybe that can help us out a little bit. All right, so this is an this is an asymptote here. Okay, now it's not the best position for it. Let me try to. Let me try to bring that down just a little bit there. Okay, so there's our horizontal asymptote, all right? It's like the first graph you showed. Mm, no, the first graph had an asymptote. First graph did have an asymptote. Let me show, let me take you back to that first graph for a second. First graph did have an asymptote. Let me erase this stuff here. There clearly is an asymptote on this one. This. This x-axis, sorry, the y-axis is an asymptote, so I'm not sure about that one, right? This one doesn't have an asymptote that's horizontal, sorry, that's vertical. It does, it does have a horizontal asymptote, so it is going to trend to, and the other thing we know is it has a y-intercept of 4. Let's put that on there as well. It's going to cross the, the y-axis at 4, so we know that. And we also need it to, let me ask another question. Do you think this function is going to be above or below the x-axis? The top is positive. The bottom, do you think the bottom is going to be positive or negative? It will be in Q1 and Q2 because there is no x-intercept. Oh, interesting. Interesting, Karis. Interesting. All right. Well, the bottom of this can never be negative. Think about it. Right. There is no way to make this negative. All right, x squared plus 2 can never be negative. So this whole function, the top is positive, the bottom is positive. So what does this look like? Well, let's reveal the mystery to you. Here's what it looks like. Whoa, who saw that coming? Unless, of course, you had your Desmos there running in the background. Um, did you see that coming? <laughs> I'm assuming it was, <laughs> would be, okay. All right, so it has all the features that we thought, right? It does have the y-intercept at 4, right? You see it does cross the y-axis there at 4. Let me erase it so you can see that. It does have the y-intercept at 4. It does trend down towards the x-axis on both sides, right? It is asymptotic to the x-axis on both sides, right? So all of what we said, it does not have a vertical asymptote. So it's all the, it does not touch the x-axis. There's no x-intercept. So if I ask you for the domain of this function, let's just talk domain and range, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for today. Let's just talk domain and range. Look at the graph. What would you say is the domain of this function? Anybody? XCR? So there's no restriction at all? You're right. It's all real numbers. Right? There is no discontinuity that's a word you're going to use in calculus when you get to calculus either next year or in, in quad four there is no discontinuity in this graph whatsoever along the x-axis this function is continuous along the x-axis nowhere does it break how about the range though look at the graph how would you describe the range of this function so Noah is thinking from zero to four, he has a square bracket on the four and a round bracket on the zero. What does the rest of the class feel about that answer? Zero to four. Harisha is saying yes, agree with Noah. What do other people think? Keontae is gonna, look at that. It looks like, it looks or sounds like Noah has a lot of people on his, uh, on, on his train there. So the Noah train is, is 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 getting full so i'm going to agree with no on that 
It's a round bracket on the zero, but a square bracket on the four. So this graph exists on the y-axis. That is entirely between zero and four. Zero not included, but it goes up to four. Four is in fact included. Okay. Now, I don't think there's anything else on this graph I really wanted to talk about. I, I will let you know that if I was going to do that interval, it would be very difficult for you to figure out the sign of this function is always um, is always positive. So I think everybody on I think we're asked that question already. It's always going to be a positive graph. The slope though is it's increasing on one side. I'm just going to talk generally about it and decreasing on the other. The change in slope, it turns out that on, on one side, up to a point, up to a point, the slope is increasing, but then it actually starts to decrease at the top. So if I were to put a, a, my hand up against the function, for most of this part here, it's going to be counterclockwise. But then at one point, when you get to the top, it's going to become clockwise. And there is what is called a point of inflection that separates the counterclockwise from the clockwise. But that's that's you don't have to worry about that for now. When you get to calculus next year or next quarter or whenever you're doing calculus, you'll talk about um, points of inflection. But you can't just say that it's rotating counterclockwise here and then clockwise over over here because there's a point somewhere along the way where it changes direction and that's if i were to sh if, you know if i were to show this on desmos you would see that on the right side it goes clockwise part of it goes clockwise right and part of it is counterclockwise so again noah for if i put this on on uh wind plot you'd see that it does keep changing its rotation and maybe at the beginning of the class on uh, on Monday, I can show you that. So it's not as easy as the ones that we had before. Just 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 so you know. Um, and as I said, to get the point of inflection on this one, it would take some calculus, and we're not ready for calculus just yet. All right, I'm going to shut it down there.